Hey everybody, welcome to our session of high frequency data worries. And we're here with Murray and Amandeep. Uh, Murray, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, sure, thanks Paul. I'm Murray Foxcroft. Um, I've been working in tech for far too long, uh, coming out through a development and architecture route, uh, having worked in uh, various organizations, including uh, some payment processes, which is relevant to today's conversation. Uh, and very happy to be here. Thank you. Amadeep? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm glad to be here at Horasis again. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Amandeep. I'm based in Denmark, uh, uh, Copenhagen. I work with a uh, financial setup called BEC Financial Technologies, which is uh, which is owned by multiple Danish banks together, uh, building the uh, new architecture, new journey um, with a lot of event streaming and uh, data streaming involved. Yeah, coming from entirely tech background. Excellent. That's me. Yep. Thank you. So, guys, I'm going to ask you a very simple question, and then we'll, we'll elaborate into the more complex. Well, what What do you think is the biggest worry uh, w within data in into economies? I mean, what's there to fear? You know, isn't it just a different way of doing things? Um, any of us? I should. Yeah, we'll go with Amandeep first. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. And so, yeah. As as a panel title says, like, what are the worries? Like, the first and most most obvious is like uh, any high frequency activity. Like, take high frequency trading. Uh, that can change the behavior of a market and all the economic agents which are modeled around that. So that's like first. So that's like okay. Can it risk some financial stability? And, and the second is like uh, central banks if they do not have that kind of a high frequency data tool set to overcome these kind of an issues uh, it could create the problems for them in assessing monetary policies and and unconventional policy measure could could also trigger on like the way we are seeing currencies crashing and rising in blips of movements and uh, so so that's like a very high level uh, stuff worry i can see uh, but then is it also like building the capabilities and the intentions behind building those capabilities we could discuss further after this yeah sure I, I think from my side i um I, I like to try and split it up into two types of high frequency data there's high frequency data that's coming towards an organization that they need to process um and the sheer volume can be can be quite overwhelming um, and then there's high frequency low latency which is you, know, you have a lot of data coming towards you but you also need to respond really quickly to it um, so as you kind of move towards that low latency scenario, so the complexity of the technology increases um, and it's really difficult for banking organizations to run that infrastructure um, and even place that infrastructure. So I've, you know, I'm aware of some trading institutions where uh, they actually build their automated trading uh, response. So uh, their automated orders into the market, they actually put that infrastructure as close as possible to the exchange um, with the aim of getting uh, millisecond or even sometimes microsecond responses so that they can trade before uh, their competitors and gain a significant advantage just by being a few milliseconds ahead of the rest of the pack. Um, so it's, it's definitely a concern for, for any banking organization to determine just how far they want to go in, in, in terms of spend versus benefits of, of having the ability to process that data. Okay, great. And is there anything uh, within the frequency and and how come it, it's it's become such a blazing hot trop, uh, topic these days? I mean, what what's happening exactly within uh, these organizations that they're starting to think about their data? Murray, you want to take this? Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> I think I think the cost of processing real time data is is fairly expensive, uh, particularly in the low latency scenarios where you need to respond quickly. You, you have to keep a lot of information in memory and memory is kind of the most expensive asset you have when it comes to computing. Um, so you know, it's it's a lot of information that you need to hold um, and then to mine it, you, know, you need some serious compute on top of that in, in order to respond. So I think what they're struggling with is to determine how much value and how much benefit they can have in terms of being able to respond quickly uh, versus uh, you know the actual spend itself. So if you take a, a 
a simple case of you know, being able to trade faster than the competition. Well, if you're doing small trades um, and you've got a very manual trading process, uh, that's not going to benefit you very much. Um, whereas if you're doing large volumes and high, vo you know, high dollar value trades um, on an automated fashion, then there's a lot of benefit to, to be gained. Um, and organizations, depending when they, where they're on in the curve, they're either you know, an entry level organization, very manual, um, or a top tier, high level hedge fund, which really wants to uh, trade quickly. Um, and and, and it's, you know, it, it's looking at the organization's investment strategy and working out how much they want to spend on the technology to try and get ahead of the competition and measuring those gains. Um, if you don't invest enough, uh, you're going to be caught out uh, and, and you're not going to get uh, the returns you want to show your investors. Um, and if you overspend, obviously, you're just burning through your company's profits. So that's the kind of headache they're facing at the moment. What about yourself, Amandi? What, what are you seeing exactly? I mean, I mean, we have central banks, we have hedge funds, we have even even just regular banks now, like your <laughs> Chase, your Bank of America, all talking about cloud data. What, what, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, so there, there are like there are two things here: uh, market forces, yes, as my as mentioned, better trading experience, better customer centricity, and then is also the compliance requirements, which uh, in in Europe we tend to follow a lot, like a lot more compliance requirements are there. And um, imagine the experience that you get with the neo banking, uh, like uh, if you're traveling somewhere or. On, um, just a click, you get an insurance, a travel insurance for a few days uh, for, with the same banking account based on your location you, and where the, your insurance uh, gets uh, kind of uh, closed also. Okay, now you have come back, so travel insurance stops here. So that kind of experience can, can a traditional bank provide? Uh, this, for example, like I'm quoting the experience with Revolut. Uh, so that is one thing. And second is like, um, that's the customer centricity. Uh, then uh, also the trading platform. So a trading platform, which gives you an edge of fast, uh, fast, faster trading, uh, more real-time trading, uh, a customer will tend to shift on that uh, trading platform. So that's the market for the compliance side, uh, anti-money laundering, like a lot of uh, flagging requirements and Denmark may, may for example, uh, got some good name on this <laughs> in recent past. <laughs> so ability to uh, kind of flag the transactions in real time, ability to act upon those, uh, ability to kind of uh, generate uh, whatever uh, decoupled processes trigger what what should happen if customer has changed an address, what should happen this uh, this transaction happened immediately after the customer has changed the address. So uh, you need a investment in those IT systems which can tell you that hey this event has happened, act on this, and this could be happening in like. Uh, in the gross real time we are talking about. So these are the different forces uh, which uh, kind of uh, uh, lead to uh, the consideration for high frequency data handling. Excellent. And because of COVID, you know, we, we've seen people become more remote. And as you're saying, the banking relationship or the banking data at least has to become uh, more available within the organization. Murray, what, what do you think about the cost factor in, in such investments that have to happen now? Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I think in the pandemic has been interesting because it's really, uh, those market forces, I mean, Deep has spoken about it, it, it's really messed around with those because instead of markets changing slowly and following trends, uh, suddenly you get these, these big spikes. Um, and <laughs> if, if you look at kind of traditional banking where... Uh, your settlement process would be you'd make a payment and then it would be T plus one or T plus two. It would take a day or two for your transaction to settle. Um, and, and when the market's moving so fast and need to respond, um, you really need <laughs> people want their payments to go through almost immediately. Um, and you've seen a lot of success in banks uh, offering a speedy payment service or almost like a real time settlement. And, and that allows people to move and shift their money and, and respond to the market um, as it changes, as news breaks, as, as different events or different policy is made. Uh, it gives people the flexibility um, to, to react quite quickly. Um, and it's quite interesting because, you know, cryptocurrency is, is really taking off uh, at the moment. But one of the things that, it, you know, it still struggles with was, is that settlement time. Um, and, and it's one of the places where traditional fiat currencies can, 
and start to compete um, yeah, with, 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 with the speed of settlement. Okay, yes, and, and yeah. we're learning that, uh, you know, uh, ourselves, we're, we're all uh, basically tech guys here, and um, most people don't understand the level of infrastructure that goes into uh, banking. But when you're thinking yeah. cryptocurrency and they say, hey, we're, we're not really centralized, you know, what, what does that mean exactly? Uh, Amandeep, do, do you think that this data just floats around or do you think that maybe there's something there that's missing that maybe the, the banks will actually uh, figure out and, and offer maybe a higher quality of service, uh, very similar, but still yet more uh, private and secured? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you asked. Yeah, that, that's actually what we call like the enabler functions of, of, of banking. So one is the retail banking as we kind of touched upon, like it's a real-time account balances. And and the, the specific answer to your question, which also limited is like, we are talking about like from a very limited view of customer to a the kind of a 360 degree view of the customer. So as I said, like um, a simple example of a customer address change. So address change can uh, can trigger what kind of a workflows. Maybe a welcome letter to oh, welcome to your new place, and oh, since you moved to this address, your insurance could cost this for this house. At the same time, because of the address change, all the AML, anti-money laundering related uh, compliance check, check can start uh, as a decoupled process. So these decoupled processes, which can trigger uh, in kind of ingestion of this uh, uh, an event of address change. And, and they can act upon, they can trigger certain workflows. They can start uh, tracking the transactions in a different way and start flagging. Uh, uh, and you could receive, and, and it happens in Denmark. <laughs> uh, you get a call from Danske back on a weekend, like, hey, you tried to transfer this money. Whom are you transferring this to? Because the system has flagged it. Uh, it's, well, I, I took an example of the AML side, which is a kind of like, uh, not a kind of a convenience to a customer, uh, uh, but a kind of a compliance check. But same thing is like like your settlement cycles are faster, your algorithmic trading, you can as a customer you can subscribe to or you build up build yourself. Um, and 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 your bank has more visibility on you in, in order to serve you better. Uh, which which is only uh, possible uh, with with the kind of a, a injection and uh, processing capability, and we are also moving from uh, banks not just collecting all the data about you to kind of like a big, big kind of a stockpile. Uh, rather, mm -hmm. it's like a comparing like a stockpile of food versus daily nutrition. So acting upon those events based on your transactions, based on your kind of like address change or other behaviors. Uh, the, the banks can continue to serve you better. Banks can continue to follow the compliance uh, better. So everybody kind of like is a win-win. Excellent. And Murray, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think I, I think banks are interesting institutions. They've always they've always been historically. You've gone to the bank and it's you you stood in a long queue and you eventually got to the front and. There's a manual teller that kind of processes something and, uh, you know, they stamp it, take it away for approval and then I open a drawer and they give you some money. That was kind of a traditional banking transaction 20 years ago. Um, and, and a lot of those processes within banks are, are still um, are still uh, fairly manual. Uh, so like Amandeep was talking about, you know, events happening. Um, the banks have had to change their whole thinking the way they they address the customer and the way they process that data uh, instead of you know setting waiting around for batches or doing something at the end of the day you know most banking technology uh, up until the last sort of five years or so it was all done on a batch frequency kind of bundle it all up midnight arrives we run some payments some processing some jobs we get some feedback some payments go through some don't go through and it takes a, a, a few days to sort it out uh, in, in order to thrive and, and survive in this modern world, they've got to rethink that whole process, move to an event-based system, and then you know, really focus on automation. Uh, manual uh, processing yes. is the uh, is the uh, um, is the, you know it, 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 it's the one thing that really ruins your ability to respond uh, even to customers. So as a change happens, uh, whether it's a balance change or an address change. Um, you need to think of that as an event that's occurring. And how do I process that through my entire banking infrastructure, through the AML, through the authorization, uh, getting the payment uh, uh, approved by the issuer, et cetera? 
all the way through until the customer gets that uh, you know either text message and transfer in their bank account that that something's gone through so there's you know it's almost an entire rethink of, of your banking infrastructure and whilst you know, a number of banks have uh, tried to keep their mainframes kind of ticking along and 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 uh, doing the processing to deal with the volumes um, they're really having to move to new new technologies to be able to uh, facilitate that um, one of the one of the ways of doing that is, is obviously on premise in your own data center uh, there's also starting to be a growing acceptance of of pushing that into the cloud and being able to process it you know through uh, you know, Microsoft Amazon Google uh, some sort of online cloud service that uh, provides a uh, a pay-as-you-go type of model instead of the bank having to try and organize and arrange these huge data centers full of infrastructure. So with, with that said, do you think that uh, the way the cloud's moving and the way that, you know, some days we see uh, Amazon takes a big hit in some data centers, yeah. is that a, uh, in your perspective, would you think that going with, with, the, with the cloud codes only is that a is that a way of maintaining something that could be up twenty four seven, or is there something that should be maybe more of a hybrid approach that could offer uh, better access to data? Yeah, it, it it really depends on the risk position of the organization. So I, I, I know some some banking uh, and financial institutions that are absolutely totally adverse to to going to the cloud. Uh, they also do have large infrastructure teams that are heavily invested. Uh, in the on-premise data centers, uh, and there's a, a reluctance towards the cloud, um, and, and that's quite understandable. You know, if you look at recent outages, you know, if a payment gateway goes down for, for an hour, um, you're literally talking about millions, billions potentially of uh, of not profit but revenue moving through those systems that, that you lose. Uh, so some organisations are, are adopting a multi-cloud strategy, um, and there's a technology called Kubernetes, which allows you to build things in kind of these cloud-agnostic containers um, and deploy them to different clouds. So you can actually run some of the infrastructure in Amazon, some of it in Azure, some of it in Google, and if one of those fails over, you can then shift your traffic around. Um, so it's it's quite important um, that uh, if if you uh, have a fairly a significant banking operation uh, and you want to provide the absolute best response to your customers um, and you want to put that in the cloud, uh, then you need to build it um, you know, across and have a multi-cloud strategy. Um, there's also, uh, within the cloud, you need to understand where the different data centers are co-located um, or located rather, um, and, and sometimes they may not be optimal in terms of the way your organization needs to move money around and, and manage transactions. So if you want absolute you know, low latency, uh, microsecond uh, based uh, trading, uh, your infrastructure needs to sit right next to that exchange um, physically. Um, so you know, clouds aren't necessarily positioned right next to that exchange. So it's, it, it's a bit of a mix and match um, and, and a hard scenario. Uh, a, a lot of the exception processing, automation, business process. Um, so if you've got a million transactions running through uh, your banking system a day, uh, any exceptions that occur, maybe 1% of, of volume, uh, that's quite acceptable to pop up into the cloud and manage that workflow. So. Um, you know, a lot of non-critical workloads can go up into the cloud quite easily, um, but the core transaction, the payment gateways uh, and, and authorization systems, um, I think those are you know, they're trying to test the waters at the moment. Um, and I guess in the next few years, we'll probably see a few move or have a, have a hybrid with an on-prem and an off-prem version of a gate, gateway. Okay. Amand, um, you want to add to that? Yeah, I I completely agree that the hybrid approach um, also like a partially is a, a compliance reason. E ECB also came in September 2019 uh, mentioning that uh, having a cloud provider is uh, like an outsourcing mm -hmm. provider. So banks cannot just pass on a blame. Okay, my service provider, my cloud provider is down. So my services are down. No, banks are assigned the responsibility that their core banking function should run. It's a responsibility with them. So that's why uh, like uh, having those core functions still with the bank, and um, non-critical workloads can go loan processing application uh, collecting kind of a code of uh, insurance premium so this kind of a pace or like platform as a service applications on kubernetes openshift they they can float on cloud as like the first adopters mm. 
and uh, maybe in a, whatever is happening in the pure batch processing right now can move as an event streaming happening inside cloud but critical functions like payment gateway uh, banks are held responsible, so they have to manage uh, uh, kind of a, their own uh, infrastructure as well. So hybrid yeah. cloud could be, yeah. 100% correct. I think the FCA guidance mandates exactly that. There's a, uh, uh, it's the onus of the institution to maintain that ability to process that business continu continuity. Uh, yeah. And that typically is, is a recommendation to use a multi-cloud strategy. Excellent. And as far as, uh, and we're, we're going to touch on this lightly because we don't want to, we don't want to piss too many people off. But when we're looking at uh, the way governments can can look into people's uh, bank accounts, where their spending is, you know, we have applications now where we're all sending money to each other, right? We're we're not thinking about it, but but really there is some sort of oversight. So how do we uh, as uh, tech guys, how do we build something that will that will keep privacy, but also we we don't want to have the wrong type of transactions happening. I mean, what are some of the basic guidelines that you think that we should be looking at uh, from maybe more of a macro sense? Yeah, I think it it, de it depends on, on what type of business you're in. If you're, if you're someone that's using a payment provider um, or a, a, a financial institution, um, so, so if you're an e-commerce e you know, online retailer, for example, um, what you want to do is you want to hold as little of that uh, customer's uh, personal data as possible. Uh, the marketing department will want you to profile and, and have it, as much demographic information as possible. Um, but on the other side, when it comes down to the payment transaction, uh, you really want to try, as, as an e-commerce provider, try to stay out of uh, PCI compliance scope. Um, and a lot of uh, payment gateways are now offer you a tokenization service. Um, so you will provide um, enough details um, to the uh, to the payment processor on your website. Uh, someone will click on their basket, they'll click pay now. It will redirect them off to the payment processor. All that processing happens. Um, so the payment processor takes the credit card number, takes the address, takes all that sensitive information. Uh, and when that transaction is complete, the payment processor just gives you a token back, a unique identifier. I'm oversimplifying it, but effectively, um, you can store that unique identifier to to act as a record of the transaction, and all that stays off of your um, off of your records. Uh, on, on the flip side, if you look at it from the perspective of of the consumer, myself, I'm in deep yourself buying something online. Uh, particularly in Europe, you've got the GDPR, which uh, which allows you to request uh, an organization to tell you what information and what data they're holding on you. Um, so that's an, an option if you're really paranoid about uh, a bank or an e-commerce provider and, and what information they have, they're holding. You can raise a subject access request and, and, uh, and they need to respond and provide that to you. Yeah, at the same, yeah, GDPR is one thing, but at the same time, like uh, Paul, this is between the time we spoke on 23rd of February, uh, European Data Act has come into kind of force. Uh, so which is uh, in literally, it looks like like uh, the government to control all the data about you, which is uh, which is done in the name of empowering individuals. So from the from your digital ID, your health data, from your financial services data, your education and training, your your employment sk and skill record data. Uh, so that kind of uh, information is also kind of getting linked at the, as per the, the roadmap till uh, 2028 says. Uh, so it's called European Data Act, 23rd February. Uh, audience can look it up. Yeah, <clears throat> so that is also coming. Excellent, uh, and and that that's a serious issue, right? Uh, Amandi, you, you know how Europeans are hypercritical about anything uh, within the internet, and and especially with privacy. You know, that's that's kind of what made Switzerland Switzerland. So, how, what kind of recommendations do you see for policymakers not to you know fall into the wrong hands? But we'll we'll give a very prime example and we're, we're not being political we're not choosing sides when yeah. uh, russia and uh, ukraine had an issue you know a bunch of ukrainian uh, civilians were talking about how their bank accounts were not uh, accessible so what are some of the things that you, you think are going to need to happen 
so that 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 is not uh you know something that can easily happen within the this us or even in europe yeah, it means I, I cannot say like like the crypto world is a like ultimate answer, but non-custodial wallets kind of come into play at some time. Um, but at the same time, like uh, from the compliance perspective, there are serious question marks on on the anonymity of those transactions. Uh, so it's a kind of like a mixed uh, bag of space. Uh, there are like a pluses and minuses in each side. Uh, one thing I kind of always suggest is like uh, GDPR kind of prohibits uh, private participations literally to manipulate or keep the data outside here or there. So much compliance around it. But when the governments are collecting that data uh, and those data leaks happen, there are like hardly any accountability and hardly any kind of explanation why this data is actually kept. Why? Uh, so that, that, that's, like, that's a kind of like a, a bringing a parity between uh, as as to the world we call it like the, the private public partnership uh, so the, the, so the european data act like so there's a complete data about you which kind of a, a central bank can kind of decide upon even your employment skill data your education everything is linked but imagine as a private player imagine as a fintech company trying to keep that much data about you and trying to build a decision or trying to make a beautiful products for you you'll be <laughs> shot down <laughs> like um, so so there's some kind of a parity some kind of a balance has to emerge uh, it requires a certain kind of a kind of a uh, consumer awareness um, also consumers choice to privacy um, that these transactions can be disclosed this cannot be disclosed um, if, if there is a third there are so many third party providers on this digital ids which are getting launched in almost every country now uh, what about the data leaks happening from those uh, those providers um, there's i think the accountabilities are not really settled in there uh, so there are there are some questions how can a fintech compete with uh, the amount of data that it want to kind of derive decisions from? So there is an advantage factor with the, whoever controls how much data about you. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I can summarize. Uh, Mary, would you like to chime in there? No, I think it's just a it's a large concern. You have these complex systems being built that can store. Uh, a huge, a huge array of information around everything that that you've done um, or do, uh, and, and whether that's you know if that's a, a bit of conspiracy theory, you says that you know what happens if the wrong data is recorded um, and it's recorded on some type of blockchain, then you know you, you you can't go back and reverse it. You have to have to do some sort of compensation transaction to rectify it, but that record is still there. So it's um um it. it it's quite concerning. Plus, with the uh, um, you know, with the desire to build these systems very quickly and potentially have them built by the cheapest bidder, um, that also raises a lot of concern around security, um, which is <laughs> which is something that that we worry about a lot in our organisation as well. We have a cyber security practice, and uh, the speed at which data comes towards us is is uh, is, is 100 percent critical. You know that uh, that uh, um, high frequency data being able to respond to security incidents um, is absolutely critical. Yeah, and also it's a connected thing is like a deployment of those algorithms, which also gets questioned a lot from the compliance and from the regulation on the like AI ethics part, like how an algorithm can make a decision. Oh yeah, because it flagged a transaction based on this and this behavior. Uh, but no, that's a kind of like, uh, it becomes an ethical question also. So they, they, those are the challenges which also come while implementing those decisions based on high frequency data ingestion and uh, processing. So I, I guess we'll we'll have some better uh, policies maybe from from learning with what, what's going on with uh, some areas of the Americas right now, where some of the citizens were, were locked out of their own accounts. A lot with, from within DeFi that space. Said, so how is it coming up? <laughs> within within what's going on with the actual data now. What do you foresee exactly what we'll be able to do to, in, in the next generation of banking? Um, you know, w will it also be a maybe like a 
more of a internet banking style of banking or or do you think that we'll still be uh, here with our retail banks and, and we'll be able to walk into places that, that we're familiar with? Uh, okay, I, I will go this then. Uh, so I, I think we are ag agreeing that uh, with more of um, automated systems being built, we're also heading into era of like what we call the programmable money in a way that like I as a consumer should be able to decide what I want to do, not just trades I want to execute, maybe convert to certain holdings, sell it back again. Uh, DeFi space, for example, is kind of giving those kind of visions, which, which probably uh, traditional banking can also compete with once it develops the capabilities of APIs of everything and high frequency data systems. Uh, so uh, that is kind of an era where I think we are headed to. Yeah, I think I also think retail banking as you know, is, is not going anywhere in a hurry. It's, it's been the stable of the economy for the last you know, 100 years plus. Um, but th there's a lot of very interesting um, use cases that the high frequency um, and processing power that we have today unlocks. Um, so I've, uh, I've been following some trends, particularly around things like insurance, where instead of uh, paying one insurance premium uh, you know, one day a year uh, to cover a vehicle, um, you, you may be able to vary your insurance um, almost on a day day by day basis, or maybe even hour hour by hour basis. So hmm. I'm not driving my car today, so I'm going to take a very high risk position. So my premium is going to be low for that day, um, but cover is also going to be very low. Uh, and maybe I'm taking my whole family on a road trip uh, for three thousand miles. Um, then I'm going to, you know, for that week or 10 days that we're away, I'm going to up my premium so that I'll get e extra additional cover to cover any any risk. So um, this kind of flexible finance, um, of, of which that's just one example, this kind of flexible finance unlocks a whole new type of, uh, of, of business that retail banks are, are very poorly, you know, e equipped to deal with. Um, and that, and that, that, that makes it really interesting. Um, you know, for, for different types of startups uh, that can uh, then leverage uh, these type of concepts to to create themselves, you know, to create themselves as differentiators in the market. Um, I know some people uh, they pay a certain amount a month for uh, TV subscriptions, uh, where you pay you know 100 euros a month to have access to movies or whatever it is, um, and those are also getting restructured as well, so that you can almost pay as you go. Uh, turn it up, turn it down, turn it off. So if you, you, you don't want to watch television for a week, you've got a big project that you need to finish at, at work, uh, you can drop that subscription for a week and then pick it up either. And there's some some interesting um, gray areas that are being exposed um, in, inside of that, where if you actually stop payment, um, you know there's a period of grace that the supplier needs to give you to resume payment. So you can almost, without without that service provider giving you a particular service, uh, just your ability to stop and start payments um, in, in in sort of near real time or high frequency um, allows you to, to to change your behavior um, and and potentially save money as a customer. Excellent. Uh, it, would you guys like to uh, add anything else? I mean, uh, I think we're coming to our end. I don't want to hold Mandeep any further. I know it's late uh, for for probably both of you. But uh, any other last uh, comments? Um, I will say like um, a, a focus on data pipelines, uh, which is a kind of a continuous uh, work to be done. Uh, we will never have probably something called like this is a settled data pipeline. So there will be always some business changes which will drive those uh, changes, how data should be processed, uh, routed and made decisions upon. So I think we are we are going to gonna sp do a lot of IT spending on, continuous IT spending on, mm -hmm. Uh, upkeeping those data pipelines. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think to add to that, you know, real time, high volume, low latency processing requires um, extreme amounts of compute plus large amounts of yeah. memory, which is really expensive. Um, and what's really been enabled, enabling some of the uh, this, these new technologies to 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 come about, uh, is the arrival of you know commodity storage, 
ch cheap storage, um, open source software, so low license, very capable cluster-based compute. So <clears throat> the technology, <clears throat> as it becomes faster and cheaper, is starting to enable all of these sort of use cases where someone may have thought of this as an idea 10 years ago, um, uh, or thought of an idea 10 years ago, but the, the equipment, it was just too expensive to implement. And as that barrier to entry uh, comes down, so some of these concepts can now uh, get brought to life um, and the affordability to the man in the street or the average finance organization uh, gets gets relatively cheaper and cheaper. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting time uh, to be um, in, in kind of, uh, you know, just in tech in general, let alone in tech and finance. Most definitely. And uh, with that, I want to thank both of you for your time and, and your expertise and uh, look forward to hearing from you guys again. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Paul.